This is the story of Last of the Summer Wine, the longest running comedy programme in Britain and the longest running situation comedy in the world. The year 2023 marks 50 years since the pilot and first series were broadcast. Like many good stories, it starts from humble beginnings, it has comedy and it has tragedy. Yorkshire in January 1930. After a time as a soldier, he worked as a policeman, teacher, salesman and taxi driver. He wrote in his spare time and soon began having plays accepted by BBC Radio, produced here at Broadcasting House in London. He established a reputation and started writing the television drama serials in the late 1960s. The BBC's head of comedy, Duncan Wood, was impressed by Clark's ability to combine drama and humour after seeing an episode of The Misfit that Roy had written, so he offered Clark the opportunity to write a sitcom. Clark was initially nervous about the venture, unsure he could find humour in the lives of patients. He later explained, it was when I realised that three old men could have the same thoughts as three young men that the comic element surfaced. The Last of the Summer Wine premiered as an episode of BBC's Comedy Playhouse series on the 4th of January 1973. The pilot received enough positive response a series was commissioned to be broadcast before the end of the year. BBC bosses didn't like the title, so it was shortened to Last of the Summer Wine as nothing else suitable was suggested. The initial series climbed from 5 to 10 million viewers, so the BBC commissioned a second series, partly helped by the fact that James Gilbert, the director of Series 1, had now been promoted to head of BBC Comedy. However, there was industrial action at the BBC in 1974 that prevented the second series being shown until 1975. Each series has between 6 and 12 30 minute episodes, with some specials running longer. There were 295 episodes over 31 series between 1973 and 2010, counting the pilot, all episodes of the series, specials and two films. Every episode of Last of the Summer Wine was written by Roy Clark. James Gilbert, Bernard Thompson, Ray Butt and Sidney Lotterby directed the first five series. Most of the remainder were directed and produced by Alan Bell. All of the episodes and specials had descriptive or cryptic titles. They didn't always help viewers deduce the plot in advance. The comedy Playhouse pilot was subtitled Of Funerals and Fish, and the episodes in the first series had subtitles as well as titles. That might well have been challenging to continue for 37 years. In 1978, Cathy Staff joined the cast of the ITV soap opera Crossroads as Doris Luke. Prompted by repeats of the 1977 Summer Wine series, the popular BBC Radio 2 presenter Terry Wogan started talking about Nora Batty and Doris Luke, suggesting they might be sisters. This resulted in his listeners writing in and inspiring the beloved Irish broadcaster to regularly jest about the characters, creating priceless publicity for Summer Wine. Then the show got a further unexpected boost in viewers as ITV, the only other channel option to BBC One and Two, suffered an 11 week industrial dispute in 1979 leading to the shutdown of nearly all ITV broadcasts and productions. Channel Television, the ITV contractor for the Channel Islands, continued to show limited programme schedules. Consequently, almost the only TV entertainment available was on the BBC. This brought new viewers to the show, reaching up to 22 million viewers per episode. Summer Wine would have been the pinnacle of their career for most writers, but Roy Clark had a couple more masterpieces up his sleeves. Inspired by his own experiences working in a corner shop, he wrote Open All Hours, and another milestone arrived in 1990 with Keeping Up Appearances. James Gilbert, who produced the pilot episode, and writer Roy Clark originally considered Rotherham as a location for the show. But the town's heavily industrialised landscape was not suitable. The comedian and writer Barry Tuck had recently filmed in Homeforth for a BBC documentary, so he suggested the town as their location. Filmmaking in Homeforth was not new when the Summer Wine crew arrived. James Bamforth was a portrait photographer in the town from 1870. 
in 1898, even before Hollywood, he started making silent comedy films that were sold worldwide. Suddenly the first oil and oil men to film them came first when the silver nitrate used the film industry was needed to make bombs. James Bamforth then concentrated on his postcard printing business here in Station Road. Not just seaside views and thatched cottages, but the saucy postcards featuring books and wives and their scorny henpecked husbands. The bonnet of seaside. Now, who does that sound like? In the Series 3 episode, The Great Boarding House Bathroom Caper, Clegg is looking at postcards in a Scarborough souvenir shop. It's just possible to make out the display rack bears the wording Bamforth's Postcards. The pilot episode concentrated activities in the town, which exemplified the sooty northern atmosphere. The exterior shots were all filmed on locations in Homefirth and the surrounding area. Many sitcoms used location filming, but none as extensively as Summer Wine. The name of the town is not mentioned in early episodes, although Blameyre is seen reading the Homefirth Express in the library, which was a real newspaper published up until 1976. In later episodes, Clegg can be seen reading its successor, the Home Valley Express, that ceased printing in 2007. You can often see mentions of Homefirth and local towns on posters in Sid's Cafe. In the 1980s, Homefirth started to become a tourist destination due to being the location for the show. Members of the Homefirth Chamber of Trade were keen to capitalise on the potential income from encouraging tourism, but Kirkley's council prioritised other areas. An article about Homefirth in the Radio Times resulted in a big increase in visitors to the area. However, there was resentment in the town by some businesses and residents, initially due to disruption filming could cause in the town, and to the perception that the show's influence changed the town for the worse, despite, or due to, the tourism caused by interest in the show. The show started to make more extensive use of the countryside. In some 30-minute episodes, only about five minutes were recorded in a studio. In the Series 28 episode, Elegy for Small Creature and Clandestine Track Bike, Clegg, Truly and Alvin are loitering in the countryside. Truly comments that Clegg is looking a bit thoughtful, to which Alvin says, It's the view. Scenery like this gets a man thinking, fills him with wonder, lifts the mind, raises it to higher things. He is right, the Yorkshire landscape is inspiring. However, Clegg's thoughtfulness was only due to him considering the medicinal benefits of a traditional remedy. The show concerns a trio of men in their 50s, originally Compo, Clegg and Blameyer, and as the title suggests, they're in the summer of their lives, but not yet in the autumn. With no wives, jobs or responsibilities to occupy them, the trio divide their time between the library, local pubs, drinking terrible tea at Sid's Cafe and strolling in the countryside. They save off boredom by getting involved in uncharacteristically youthful activities. Some of their antics involved, Compo accidentally starts an unattended steam locomotive and the trio chase after it and try to stop it, Compo volunteers to test drive Wesley's racing car, but the engine explodes in a cloud of smoke. Seymour designs a car ejector seat mechanism with Compo as test subject, getting repeatedly shot into the air and finally nearly blown up. Any of their exploits might involve falling out of a tree or uncontrolled propulsion into water. In the Series 15 episode, Aladdin Gets On Your Wick, the trio try out Foggy's version of a three-man sailboard, having previously seen somebody sailboarding on the reservoir. The conclusion was, all three ended up with a soaking. In the Series 26 episode, Watching the Clock, Clegg, whilst up a tree, asked, we used to fall a lot in those days, how come we never got killed? The stunt coordinators and stunt doubles, often including Terry Cade or Stuart Fell, were kept busy, although Bill Owen did a lot of his own stunts. Despite the falls and soakings, the trio never suffer more than wet clothing or slight discomfort. Except in the Series 26 episode, Available for Weddings, when Clegg breaks a leg in an out-of-control descent downhill on a bicycle. 
However, let's not forget that television sitcoms exist in a special universe, a cartoonish world where coincidences are common and events don't always have the outcome expected. In the series 11 episode, Three Men and a Mangle, the trio are entrusted by Nora to deliver her old mangle to a friend. Seymour's tie gets caught in the rollers and rather than release the mechanism, Compo gleefully cuts the tie off with scissors. Later, as a shortcut, Seymour decides that they should hoist the mangle onto a viaduct from the road below. This results in the mangle falling and crashing through the roof of the parked police car of PCs Cooper and Walsh. The PCs never find out what caused the damage to their car and it's never mentioned again. This mostly timeless cartoon world of no consequences means that it generally does not matter what order you watch the episodes, everything will be back to normal in the next episode. The significant exceptions are the trilogy of episodes when Compo dies in series 21 and the final series that Roy Clark wrote as a six part serial. I was about 11 years old when the pilot and first series aired. The pilot was shown at 8pm on a Thursday, but series 1 to 4 and 6 were broadcast on a Wednesday at 9.25 after the watershed, so it's unlikely I saw them the first time they were broadcast. From series 7 the first showing was always on a Sunday, usually starting between 7 to 8pm, and from series 21 on a Sunday, usually starting between 5.30 and 6.15. It was not just the broadcast times that changed, but the content of the episodes. I'd wrongly remembered that the first two series were in black and white. By the time I saw repeats of those series, I would have seen them on a colour television. The reasons that those episodes feel like they were in black and white was due to them being mostly concentrated in the town, which is very grim looking in places, exaggerated by the gloomy weather. The language and the conversation could be dark and gritty too. In the series one episode, Short Back and Palais Glide, the trio visit a barber shop. There's a girly calendar on the wall, blurred out in recent repeats, and Compo is thumbing through a porn magazine. He draws attention to one of the magazine images and Clegg remarks, that's almost exactly the way we used to carry two rolls of lino when I was in fixtures and fittings. Episodes in the early series had little in the way of a main plot. We're just eavesdropping on three old friends muddling their way through life. In episode one of the first series, one of the plot points was to find Compo's house key, which causes the trio to go on a mini expedition around town. But eventually Compo realises he can just get in through a window. Although the show originally focused on the trio, Sid and Ivy at the cafe and Compo's neighbours Nora and Wally, the cast expanded over the years to include an ensemble of characters. Some later episodes still focused on a nucleus of characters, the only speaking roles in the Series 5 episode, Full Steam Behind, were the trio, although there were non-speaking roles and a brass band. While other episodes had most of the regulars, plus guest performers and other supporting roles. Initially, the Yorkshire countryside does not feature extensively. In the Series 1 episode, The New Mobile Trio, on the inaugural drive of their newly acquired car, they crash it on a country road and walk home. Blameyer gets a bug for photography and wants to capture the sunrise in Series 1 episode, Hail, Smite, Morn, or thereabouts, but camping out overnight is ruined by a storm, so they shelter here in what was at the time a Seri Demolic Barn. It is not until Series 5 the trio spend more time in the countryside, especially in the two-part story The Flag and Its Snags and The Flag and Further Snags, where Foggy plans to erect a flagpole on a hill. In the Series 6 episode, A Bicycle Made for Three, we see a new look for Sid's Cafe, which has undergone some redecoration. As Clegg comments, they had done away with the homely air of neglect. Series 6 was the first series to be produced and directed by Alan Bell, who went on to produce almost all the subsequent series. There had been four different producer-directors for the first five series. Alan Bell was used to directing for film, so most of the show was made using film cameras on location and from Series 14, film in the studio as well, rather than videotape. Alan Bell liked using wide shots to include the countryside. 
he also used long single shots with camera cranes and rigs to move the camera around the action instead of multiple camera angles and lots of edits. This filmic style was further enhanced with the introduction of widescreen broadcasts from the New Year special The Man Who Nearly Knew Pavarotti, first broadcast on the 1st of January 1995. The trio had the occasional fall, collision or dip in the water before, but from Christmas 1984 special The Loxley Lozenge, the trio are more frequently involved in schemes likely to precipitate an accident, until series 17 when their antics are mostly less dangerous. It was a conscious decision by Roy Clark to concentrate on humorous dialogue instead of the stunts. It was also practical to reduce the need for stunt performers and specialist props as the BBC were not generous with the budget. Even when the trio go off to experiment with a contraption, Howard and Marina sneak off for a bike ride and the ladies take a drive in Edie's car, Despite the massive area of countryside at their doorstep, they somehow inevitably all manage to end up in the same place. In the series 17 episode, The Suit That Turned Left, the trio meet a man who has a device that can detect the centre of magnetism in Yorkshire, and his device leads them to a field. Meanwhile, the ladies are out on a trip on a bus when it breaks down nearby. As the magnetism device is operated, it emits a high-pitched squeal which brings Howard and Marina out of hiding in front of everybody. The predictability of the conclusion, however, should not detract from the entertaining journey each party took to arrive at their destination. The ladies' coffee circle becomes a staple element of the show, often meeting at Edie's home. The ladies talk about the incompetence of men and criticise any women not present. However, occasionally their issues merge with whatever activity the men are involved in. In the series 15 episode, There Are our Gypsies at the Bottom of Our Garden, Foggy invites the ladies on a nature tour, as he believes he has found the nesting place of a giant woodpecker, after hearing tapping noises in the woods. On finally arriving at the location, there's no woodpecker, just Howard and Marina in a makeshift treehouse. There are recurring themes. You can't blame Roy Clark for recycling an old joke for a new audience. In the series 13 episode, Pole Star, Compo tries to learn pole vaulting to impress Nora so he can vault onto the wall to tie a washing line to the post. In the series 26 episode, Hermione the Short Course, Alvin tries pole vaulting. On the first attempt, he goes straight over the wall into the water, just like Compo did. Ronnie Hazelhurst produced themes for many television series, including Are You Being Served, Yes Minister, and Only Fools and Horses. Ten years before he was asked to compose the Summer Wine theme, Ronnie Hazelhurst was officially recognised for the originality of his compositions and arrangements. BBC producer Eric Miller noted his appreciation of the outstanding work of Ronnie Hazelhurst in a memo to the assistant head of Light Entertainment Sound. The BBC initially disliked the Summer Wine theme. Their opinion was that a comedy show would not work with such mellow music. Comedy shows usually have a theme that announces, this is going to be funny. Eventually, Hazel Hurst's harmonica-based waltz was accepted. It's rare for a sitcom to have incidental music. Comedy shows might have a sting, a short musical clip, to punctuate the end of a scene or to play over a change in location, but Summer Wine had music to accompany many of the scenes, written to fit in with the pace of the trio walking, or percussive beats when Compo kicks a stone down the road, or for some other comic expression. Ronnie Hazelhurst included leitmotifs for characters, especially for the police, Eli, Truly and Billy Hardcastle, sometimes only a bar or two, just to highlight the character as they appear. The instrumental theme featured lyrics on just three occasions. The 1981 Christmas special, Whoops, has two verses of lyrics written by Roy Clark and performed by the Home Firth Choral Society over the closing credits. 
The 1983 film, Getting Sam Home, uses those two verses with an additional two and plays them over the opening credits. The third and final time was for the series 21 episode, Just a Small Funeral, that was filmed here at Christchurch Helm. The Val Stokes singers sang another version of the theme tune, this time with lyrics rewritten to reflect Compo's death, over a montage of classic locations partway through the episode, just before Compo's funeral. In addition to having vocals, the closing theme is given a special treatment on a few other occasions. Some of the Christmas specials have closing themes to match the style of the end scene or the main plot, even having an E.T. adaptation for the 1993 Welcome to Earth episode. For an episode in Series 16, The Most Powerful Eyeballs in West Yorkshire, the concluding theme is played by brass band at Marching Pace. Last of the Summer Wine continued to be popular with viewers and was renewed year after year despite rumours as early as the 1980s that the BBC wanted to end the show and replace it with a new programme aimed at a younger audience. Its popularity made cancelling the show hard to justify. In the 1980s, episodes of Summer Wine were in the top 10 viewed programmes of the year four times with up to 18.8 .8 million viewers. Even repeats on BBC One sometimes received ratings of 5 million viewers per episode, when first showings of EastEnders, the BBC's flagship soap, were only getting 4 million viewers. Last of the Summer Wine was awarded the National Television Award for Most Popular Comedy Programme in October 1999. Some of the programme's key attributes, the slower pace, gentle comedy, older characters engaging in juvenile activities were what made it popular, but also gave rise to criticism. Stand-up comics and critics derided the show for predictable plot lines, which is still a common feature of TV sitcoms, and that every episode ended with somebody going downhill in a bath. Well, it didn't. It never did. In the series 15 episode, Stop That Bath, the trio and Howard are transporting a bathtub on a trolley, Part way through the episode they lose control of it, just here. Compo ends up in the bath and careers down this hill, past a bemused Eli and comes to rest outside a car repair workshop that used to be just here. They then continue their journey. The spin-off prequel show, First of the Summer Wine, premiered on BBC One in 1988. Written by Roy Clark, it was set in the months leading up to the Second World War. Most of it was not filmed in Homeforth, although the post office here in Netherthong was featured. Period music was used to create the atmosphere of the era. Peter Sullis, Maggie Ulrenshaw and Jonathan Lindsley appear in the spin-off as well as the original series. Sullis played the father of his own character from the original show, Ulrenshaw played his mother and Lindsley appeared during the second series as Chunky Livesey. Only two series are made of the spin-off, partly due to the expense of recreating the period locations. Due to the longevity of the series, it was inevitably going to be necessary to introduce new characters due to illness, death or unavailability of actors for other reasons. Many of the new characters were first seen in one-off appearances and were popular enough for them to be brought back as regulars. In 2008, the BBC announced that Russ Abbott would join the show in series 30 as Luther Hobbo Hobdyke. Abbott was cast as the new third man, allowing Peter Sallis and Frank Thornton to continue their roles on the show in a reduced capacity. However, there was a shock coming for the cast, crew and fans of Summer Wine. Interviewed by the Huddersfield Examiner newspaper in December 2008, director Alan Bell revealed the BBC's decision to end the show. He stated the show was act by email. The reason given by Jay Hunt, the new controller of BBC One, was the unavailability of pre-watershed slots to transmit the show. Although Alan Bell's book, Last of the Summer Wine from the Director's Chair, states the email was received on the day editing was finished on Series 31, he also stated this was in November 2008, which is when Series 30, to be broadcast starting April 2009, would have been completed. 
this confusion might be due to Alan Bell misremembering or quoting the US series numbers. However, neither Bell nor the BBC management had anticipated the reaction of the British public. Angry viewers sent 800 letters of complaint, resulting in the BBC stating that no decision had been made and would not until after the current series was broadcast. June Whitfield, a recent addition to the Summerwine family, who had worked in BBC television and radio since the 1950s, told the Daily Express, The BBC don't like old people. They are all so young themselves. To have upset a broadcasting legend sufficiently for it to voice an opinion must have been a shock to BBC management. A month later, without ever admitting it was axed, the BBC announced the 31st series for broadcast during the summer of 2010 had been commissioned. At the same time, the BBC decided it would be the last series, but kept that decision quiet. In a case of serendipity, in September 2010, controller of BBC One Jay Hunt was placed on gardening leave from the BBC. An employment tribunal had upheld complaints from a TV presenter of age discrimination and victimisation by Hunt. Hunt joined Channel 4 in January 2011 as Chief Creative Officer, where she later faced further age discrimination accusations. There was criticism of the BBC for not permitting a special final episode. However, Roy Clark stated he was fully aware this was the last series and he preferred the show to have a quiet ending. So he wrote the last series as a six-part serial in which Pearl finally has enough of Howard and throws him out. The final episode featured nearly all the extended cast. Repeats of the show were broadcast in the UK on BBC One until July 2010 and are still shown on UK TV channels Gold, Yesterday and Drama. It's also seen in more than 25 countries including the United States and Canada. Summer Wine paved the way for older folks behaving badly, although not as madcap as Compo & Co, including You're Only Young Twice, Waiting for God, Boomers and Hold the Sunset. The last episode of the show, How Not to Cry at Weddings, was broadcast on the 29th of August 2010. The final line was said by Peter Sallist, the longest serving actor. Did I lock the door?